Hello everybody, it's Scott again, back with the Sengoku series. Um, it's been a while, needless to say, I think the last video was in July. Um, and I won't, you know, really get into all the details, just suffice it to say, professional and personal things came up, as they always do, and I had to put them first before the videos, and, you know, now I'm at a point where I can pick up the videos again, so I'm just gonna keep on going with um, the series where we left off, which was the middle of the Ieyasu biography series. Um, so here I am, all nice and warm in my apartment. We're going through a bomb cyclone followed by a polar vortex on the East Coast. Um, I'm in D.C. Uh, so it's very chilly, but um, I'm nice and cozy in my apartment. I got some sparkling water, some LaCroix um, with me to keep me refreshed. Uh, so let's just uh, jump in where we left off. Um, last time uh, we finished with the defeat of the Takeda by the o Oda Togawa Alliance. Uh, Nobunaga had pressured Ieyasu to kill his son and heir uh, Nobuyasu um, because Nobuyasu was accused of plotting against uh, the Oda with the Takeda. And Ieyasu, having very little choice in the matter, went along with it. Uh, and killed his wife and eldest son at the time. Um, but um, in terms of the clan, uh, the Tokugawa did very well after the defeat of the Takeda. They got uh, Sur Suruga province, um, and they uh, Iyasu made a deal with the Hojo to his east, uh, the major power to his immediate east. And... <clears throat> You know, everything was going fine until 1582, when Nobunaga is getting ready to go westward to fight the Mori with uh, Hideyoshi, uh, when one of his senior retainers, uh, Akeche Mitsuhide, rises up in rebellion and kills Oda Nobunaga and his son Nobutada uh, at the Honoji uh, Temple in Kyoto. Um, Iyasu was apparently at Sakai, which is more or less modern-day Osaka, at the time, and, you know, like the rest of everyone, almost everyone at the time, he was not prepared for this uh, assassination out of nowhere, and basically has to sit back and watch while Hideyoshi sprints from western Japan all the way to central Japan and wins the Battle of Yamazaki, defeats Mitsuhide, and more or less asserts himself as um, the successor to Nobunaga. Uh, at the Kiyosu conference that follows, uh, we know Hideyoshi uh, sides with uh, Nobu uh, Tada's son, the infant Samboshi. Uh, um, Iyasu more or less remains neutral. Uh, Shibata Katsue picks a different uh, claimant. Uh, they have a fight. Uh, Iyasu uh, stays out of it, uh, doesn't really do anything. Um, Instead, he focuses on basically seizing land um, in sort of this power vacuum, vacuum that emerges. Uh, and so from, uh, you know, in sort of this post-Honoji confusion, uh, the Tokugawa take Kai and Shinano province. And <clears throat> he's frustrated a little bit uh, by uh, Sanada Masayuki, the father of the famous uh, Sanada Yukimura and Nobuyuki. Um, and manages to hold out uh, against uh, Tokugawa at uh, Ueda Castle. Um, and there's almost war with the Hojo, uh, who were quite alarmed at Ieyasu's expansionism um, eastward. Um, but Ieyasu manages to strike a deal. He has uh, friends among the Hojo. Um, as I mentioned at the Battle of uh, Shizugatake between Hideyoshi and Katsue, uh, Togawa Iyasu remains neutral. He doesn't get involved. Uh, Hideyoshi wins. And then in 1584, um, Oda Nobukatsu, who originally had been on the side of Hideyoshi, um, but then Hideyoshi flips the script and says, I want you to pay homage to me, I'm your lord, you're my vassal, as to oppose to the sort of the fiction that had been running up until that time that, you know, the Oda clan was still the dominant force. Um, 
so Oda Nobukatsu, who's always had sort of pretensions of of being the successor to Nobunaga, goes to Ieyasu and says, look, Hideyoshi's a jerk, let's ally against him and, and, and fight him. And Ieyasu uh, does so, and from this emerges the Kamaki campaign. Um, it's sometimes called the Battle of Kamaki and Naga uh, Kute. Um, the reason why Kamaki comes from Mount Kamaki, which is a mountain in Owari province, uh, modern-day Aichi prefecture, and uh, most of the battles are fought around there. Uh, it mainly involves uh, a lot of very defensive uh, you know, battlements and palisades set up by the uh, Togawa clan against Hideyoshi, and it's basically a stalemate. You know, there are various attempts to you know, get around the defensive positions and, and you know, flank the other side. And it doesn't really come to much. Um, it's basically a minor uh, tactical Tokugawa victory, which means, you know, they win defensively. They don't allow the, Hide, uh, uh, the Hide, Hideyoshi's forces to, to score any decisive victories. Uh, but at the same time, it's a long-term political victory for Hideyoshi, um, because in the end... Uh, Ieyasu has to sue for peace, um, and you know it's it's well documented that Ieyasu, even though he eventually strikes a peace deal with Hideyoshi, he's not he doesn't really feel disempowered by doing so. He basically doesn't really lose anything in terms of his actual power and influence as one of the leading um, warlords, feudal lords of this time. Um, from Sadler, I like to read a little expert, uh, excerpt. In the first month of 1585, Oda Nagamasu, Takigawa Katsutoshi, and Hashiba Katsumasa went to Mikawa to sound out Ieyasu, who was hawking in the country, that is, you know, falconry, and uh, they followed him there. Hawk on wrist, Ieyasu rejected their proposal unceremoniously. That is the proposal to um, give him to Hideyoshi. They retired to, to their lodgings, and the next day, Hashiba Katsumasa tried again. You're still here, are you? said Ieyasu irritably when he saw him. But I'm doing you a service, replied Katsumasa, for if you don't submit, Hideyoshi will bring a huge army against you, and you spend your time hawking. Your castle and fortresses are not in the best repair, either. Look here, retorted Ieyasu. I've had enough of this. He can't bring more than 100,000 men, and if he does come... And I have thirty or forty thousand, but he doesn't know the country about here, and I do. So if he risks it, he'll be getting the beating of his life. He seems to have forgotten Nagakude pretty quickly. And as for you, I advise you to make yourself scarce at once, or you will be in even greater danger. Danger. Hashiba did so without delay. So of course that's apocryphal. It's you know not real history. I'm sure it didn't really happen. Um, but it does sort of illustrate uh, sort of the perspective that Ieyasu could have taken at this time, which is. Um, you know, if, if Hideyoshi wants to come and break me and utterly destroy me and remove me as a threat to his power, he's free to do so, but it's going to come at a huge cost to him. And at the time, you know, 1585, you know, the, 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 the unification of the country is still, you know, far ways away. You know, even if Hideyoshi has made peace with the Mori in Western Japan, he still has to deal with the Chosokabe on Shikoku, he still has to deal with the Shimazu, who have almost totally conquered Kyushu. Uh, he's still got the Hojo in the far uh, east of Japan, and of course the Date in uh, the northeast northeast Japan. So he 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 basically you know he's a guy who prefers the diplomatic route to begin with, and you know he probably he probably realizes what a huge cost it would it would be for him to actually to, to destroy Ieyasu and force a, a major battle at that point. So at the very least, he seeks to to delay sort of that showdown with Ieyasu. Um, so after the peace deal with Hideyoshi, uh, Hideyoshi does indeed turn his attention to Shikoku and Kyushu, and in both of those campaigns, uh, the Tokugawa forces do not participate at all, which, again, speaks to how sort of influential and powerful Ieyasu was to sort of you know, be off the hook for those campaigns. Um, but in 1589, when Hideyoshi moves against uh, the Hojo and their stronghold of Odawara Castle, 
in the Kanto. Um, Togawa Iyasu is not allowed to sit this one out. He has to participate. And indeed, out of the 220,000 troops that Hideyoshi marshals against the Hojo, Iyasu contributes around 30,000 of them. And there are some stories that are out there uh, about you know how close Iyasu came to uh, turning against Hideyoshi at this point and siding with the Hojo. Uh, there's a story that uh, Oda Nobukatsu, who was still around at this point, came to him and was like, hey, well, Hideyoshi's attacking Odawara Castle. We can attack him from the rear and win. Uh, there's another one about I uh, Naomasa, another one of the Iyasu's retainers, uh, making a similar suggestion, and Iyasu sort of shuts them down both times, uh, saying, well, it's not... Destiny does not favor me in this instance, so it's not, I'm not going to do that. So, <clears throat> of course, with, you know, it's Bull, you know, toward, you know, he doesn't see the future, and, you know, there are plenty of times where if he had seen the future, then a lot of his decisions don't make any sense because he made some pretty dumb mistakes. Um, you know, it's simply more expedient to go against the Hojo. Um, you know, the Hojo sort of thought they could maybe, I guess, repeat their victories against... Uh, the Uesuji and the, and the Takeda, where they sort of just retreated into Orowara Castle, which was this huge, very powerful defensive position. Um, but whereas, you know, previous besiegers didn't really have the time or the resources or the security to do a long, drawn-out siege, um, by 1589-1590, there are no real threats to Hideyoshi, um, he can sort of, he does go to Orowara or Castle with, you know, entertainers, jugglers, prostitutes, all these things, and, you know, kind of makes a, a fun time out of this long, drawn-out siege, siege that eventually, you know, the Hojo have to surrender because they're running low on food and resources and so on. So Ieyasu does take part in the defeat of the Hojo. And this is where something really interesting happens, where... Ho, uh, Ieyasu is pretty much forced to give up the five provinces under his control in exchange for the eight provinces of the Kanto. He's basically given the lands that belong to the Hojo. The problem with this on paper is, well, on paper it's, it's a good deal because he loses five provinces, Mikawa, Totomi, Suruga, Shinano, and Kai, and in exchange, he gets uh, the whole Kanto, which is eight provinces. The problem, though, is that uh, only four out of those eight provinces are free at the time. Um, so he probably doesn't actually get, you know, the same deal. But these are still rich provinces. He's still a rich man by getting these provinces. Um, the reason why Hideyoshi makes Iyasu do this... Well, there's a couple reasons. First is purely geography, which is, you know, Hideyoshi is based in Kyoto, the capital, which is in central Japan. And if he manages to push Ieyasu all the way to sort of far southeastern Japan, um, he's less of a geographic immediate threat to the Toyotomi. He's also uprooted uh, Ieyasu from his traditional power base in Makawa where, you know, the Matsudaira and the Tokugawa have ruled for time out of mind, and he's basically given land where the people are used to the Hojo clan. And, you know, in reality, did, did the average person really care if it was Hojo or Tokugawa ruling over them? Maybe not in reality, but, you know, definitely in, I guess, sort of the samurai mentality of the time, you know, the idea of, like, the peasants are just loyal to their lords. So if you change lords, you know, there's going to be this moral outrage about it. You know, whether such an outrage manifested, I doubt it. There's no, I don't think there's any evidence of that happening. Um, you know, and basically, Iyasu was a man who kind of, like Nobunaga, acknowledged merit and didn't have any prejudices against hiring trainers outside of his clan. Uh, in fact, he had taken several of the Takeda retainers on board after the Takeda had been defeated, uh, and he did the same with some of the Hojo retainers after they were defeated. Um, so he was a man that, you know, 
acknowledged talent and took it on regardless of who you know a person had served previously um which would actually come to help him out a great deal um but i also want to add another anecdote from from sadly here uh during the campaign of odawara hideyoshi offered ieyasu the lordship of the eight provinces in the kanto and he accepted it this meant that he would move to the eastward beyond the barrier of hakon the hokone mountains and would relinquish his ancestral fief of Makawa with the provinces of Totomi, Suruga, Shinano, and Kai that he had conquered himself, and these would naturally then come under the control of Hideyoshi. The offer is related in the... I'm sorry, Kwan, Hashu, Kosen, Roku, as follows. One day Hideyoshi went out with Ieyasu, who was in charge of the main army there, to inspect the castle of Odawara. Taking Ieyasu's hand, he said, See... We shall soon overthrow the Hojo now, so I promise you as your fief, Fife, the eight provinces of the Kanto. Good. Let's piss on the bargain, then uh, replied Ieyasu, and the pair of them went over toward the castle and pissed together. So to this day, the children speak of them as the pair of pissers on the Kanto, or Kanto no Sure Shoben. Again, pardon my terrible Japanese... The words and names and places that I know come purely from video games. So if I, <laughs> when it comes to speaking Japanese that I haven't encountered before, I'm terrible at it. Anyway, I do not know why, you know, shared um, urination to honor a deal. I mean, I'm familiar with sort of, you know, blood packs or blood brothers where, you know, you cut the hand and rub the blood together and swear. N never heard of pissing together, um, uh, you know. If there's a thesis out there about 17th century Japanese feudal urination ceremonies, um, let me know. I'll, I'll read it and share it with the audience. Um, and I just want to kind of underline this, how, how crazy <laughs> this must have made Ieyasu, because he starts out with nothing. He starts out under the thumb of the Imagawa and the Oda. You know, breaks free of the Imagawa, conquers Imagawa provinces. He takes, you know, Makawa, Totomi, and Suruga. Then when the Takeda are boned, <laughs> he takes Shinano and Kai and has to, like, really hustle to make a deal with the Hojo and, you know, uh, consolidate this power. And, like, you know, he's come from literally nothing to something, some you know, a big something. And then he has to lose it all and take this huge gamble of relocating to these provinces that he does not have any sort of historical claim to, where he's sort of a stranger, and, you know, make something out of that and consolidate his power. Now, fortunately, you know, Hideo fortunately for Ieyasu, you know, Hideyoshi has these ambitions to conquer China by way of invading Korea. And once again, the Tokugawa forces are kind of left off the hook. You know, Hideyoshi doesn't really want to spend the political will or the political capital to force Ieyasu to participate. He does make Ieyasu come with him to his headquarters in Kyushu, um, where it's pretty much agreed that all the only reason he does that is so he can keep an eye on Ieyasu while Hideyoshi and all of his loyal retainers are off fighting in Korea and getting their butts kicked. Um... You know, in the meantime, he has a lot of, he also has his cable retainers back in the Kanto, um, you know, taking care of things for him, building up uh, his provinces, developing uh, production and, you know, crops, commerce, um, the industries for war, all these things. Um, meanwhile, Ideoshi quite, you know, foolishly in hindsight is, you know, wasting all this manpower of, of, of the of the clans that would be most loyal to the Toyotomi name um, in this, uh, in, well, two series of, I guess, campaigns against Korea and into China. Um, and there's this proverb that, in, Jap in Japan, that uh, Ieyasu, you know, won by retreating, that is, by, by retreating from his power base in Makawa and the surrounding provinces that he had conquered, and moving to... Uh, to southeast Japan, uh, again, he won. Um, which, again, you know, goes back to some of the adages I talked about in the first Ieyasu video about him waiting for the bird to sing as opposed to trying to make it sing or enticing it to sing. Um, you know, basically by taking the path of least resistance, you know, not fighting Hideyoshi, 
Um, but instead of going along with his plans, um, he puts himself in a position to take advantage when uh, Hideyoshi finally dies in um, 1598, or am I getting that wrong? Um, and then, you know, uh, to, to fight uh, Ishida Mitsunari at Sakagahara in 1600. Um, Hideyoshi actually appoints uh, Ieyasu to uh, the Council of Five Regents that is supposed to rule in his place after he dies until his uh, heir, the minor Hideyori, comes of age. Uh, Ieyasu, of course, is the least trustworthy of the five um, that are, are named to this council. Um, he's the one that has sort of the least loyalty to Hideyoshi and the Toyotomi. Um, and again, once you know, those, um, you know, once uh, several of, uh, I believe it's mostly Maida Toshie, when he dies, that's when Ieyasu really makes his move. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next video. I'm going to talk about the Battle of uh, Sekigahara. Um, we're going to go into uncharted territory, because now we're all caught up. Like, we've covered everything that I've covered in the Nobunaga videos. We've covered everything that I've covered in the Hideyoshi videos. Um, so in the next and final... Ieyasu video, we're going to go into uncharted territory and talking about after Hideyoshi's death and uh, how uh, Ieyasu uh, established the Tokugawa shogunate, which would rule for three centuries, basically, uh, until uh, the Boshin War and uh, the Meiji uh, Revolution. Um, so I'll leave it there. It's kind of a short video, I think, relatively speaking. Um... You may have noticed that a lot of my videos previously, that I previously posted, have become unlisted. And the reason was I was teaching a course and it kind of came up that my students, some of my students had found the Sengoku series videos and kind of ribbed me for a little while and I was a little self-conscious about it. So I made them unlisted videos, which means you could find them through the links on the forums, on the Samurai Cars forums, but you couldn't find them if you were just searching for Samurai history stuff on, on YouTube. But I think I'm going to change that. Like I'm not ashamed of these videos i'm not ashamed of you know that i know these things and that i'm a sengoku period nerd and all that stuff and um i don't know i'm trying to embrace it instead of sort of being self-conscious about you know all the things that i am a nerd about um also just to plug the samurai cars podcast uh i recorded a video uh, not a video but a sort of a me talking basically <laughs> I recorded me talking about uh, Kenshin, Yusuji Kenshin, um, uh, for the podcast. And I think that's supposed to come up this month if it hasn't come up already. Um, to be honest, like I said, I haven't been super into following samurai stuff lately. Um, but check that out uh, when it comes out. And I'm still planning to do um, a Kenshin video series, or at least one video, uh, after I finish the Ayasu series, plus uh, I think... Takara Shingen and Mori Mutanari are the ones that I want to do after I finish the three great unifiers. So again, as always, questions, comments, feedback, criticism, all are welcome, uh, either on the Samurai Cars forums or on my YouTube videos, which should be, will be public again. Uh, and also, as ever, please, if you can, throw some money to the people, the fine people at the Samurai Archives website, either by buying a book through their Amazon link on their page uh, or by going to their uh, patreon and, and throwing them some money because they are great and um there wouldn't be i don't think as much knowledge publicly available to the holy polloi the public you and me um if it weren't for them um because they've taken all this knowledge that is in japanese or is otherwise obscure and unavailable and made it uh publicly available and that's the spirit by which i'm doing these videos is trying to make education about this period and these interesting figures uh, more accessible so thank you have a great day and uh, may you piss together with a friend over uh, a, a great bargain or deal in the near future bye